Here it goes. Do we get slides now? Yay. Hi, everybody. So when I pitched this session to the PSU folks, it was called Notarization and Mac OS, what it does, why you need it, and how the OS handles it when you don't have it, which is a super easy to print you know, slide, and I felt really bad for wrecking everybody's like carriage returns. Um, so I've renamed this presentation the Loyal Order of Notaries and how notarization affects Mac admin life. Um, I, this is a joke of, of, that is very DC specific. There's a guy in DC, his name is Helder Gill, uh, and he tweets the DC Register, which is like the formal government announcements that happen in DC once a month. And uh, part of that is the announcement of who the new notaries are. His joke was that they have joined the loyal order of the notary. Um, and so we're gonna talk a lot about notarization, but first I'm gonna tell you who I am. My name is Tom Bridge and I am not a notary public. Um, I work at a company called Technolutionary in the greater DC area. We're an IT operations firm. Um, what are we here for? Recently, the topic of notarization has become more and more on the lips of every Mac admin, um, probably because we found out a lot about new things that were coming in Mac OS this fall that relate to notarization, as well as effects of uh, changes made to the operating system in 14.5. Uh, Sometimes notarization is preceded by profanity, sometimes it is appended by a snapping gesture, like the aristocrats. Uh, but it's a new topic, and so I wanted to take a moment here to talk about what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of things. All of these are related to notarization. I want to talk about what a notary is for, generally speaking. We're going to have to spend a huge amount of time talking about what Gatekeeper is and what it does. We're going to have to talk about the um, SPCTL binary, uh, Stapler, and some other tools that are now in the operating system if you have Xcode and the Xcode command line tools. We're going to talk about notarizing software with Xcode, um, notarizing by hand uh, after the fact, and then we're going to talk about some troubleshooting stuff, and we're going to finish with a summary of, of what you know. Because uh, the, the answer with a good talk is that you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them the thing, and then you tell them what you told them. That kind of repetition is here to make sure that this concept breaks through. Um, what's a notary? I like to start any review of a technology that's named after something else uh, in another domain uh, with a review of what the source material is. In the physical world, we've got a whole class of people, they are people, um, they aren't robots yet, um, that are certified by localities and states to act as neutral witnesses. They're there to make sure that the people signing their documents are who they say they actually are. To get more information about a notary, about what a notary is, I did a crazy thing and I went to talk to one. Um, the notary I spoke with answered a whole bunch of my questions and she was absolutely tremendous. Um, I'm gonna read because we did this all through email. Uh, I, this is her speaking. She said, I received my official notification, uh, or notarization commission for the state of Maryland in February of 2018. I have rarely needed to use it and have only used it for people that I know personally. But I'm happy to answer questions so that you may find the information useful. What does it take to become a, a notary in the state of Maryland? It was much easier than I expected. I googled notary in Maryland requirements to learn what it takes to become a notary. This site provided a clear outline and application form and it's a link to the uh, Secretary of State's website in Maryland. Uh, I read the required material, completed the required forms and paid the required fees. Within a few days, my references were checked because it does require that you prove that you are who you say you are and that other people will in fact vouch for you and say, yeah, they're all right. Um, after that, uh, it, they received a notification that the application had been approved and they had five to 10 days to go pick up their commission in the courthouse and be sworn in. Uh, identification and another form and another check was all I needed to pick up my official document. Then I was sworn in with another notary, uh, signed a register and I was on my way. To, perfectly, to be perfectly honest, I had a harder time selecting my notary stamp and log from an online vendor. So can you walk me through the steps of witnessing a document and affixing your seal? I asked the person or people in advance to bring two forms of identification just in case. Upon meeting the individuals, I ask for identification for verification purposes. I enter the ID number into my notary log. If it's someone I do not know, I would ask for their fingerprint, but I have not been faced with this type of request yet. I look over the document that needs notarization. In some cases, I did not read specifics since we are not allowed to provide legal guidance, and it was a private matter. I make sure to read to the, bot the, the bottom portion to see if there are specific instructions on where my notary seal should be affixed. 
In most cases, it does not have a designated area. Then I ask the individual if it is okay for me to put my seal on that, uh, on that side of the document. I watch the individual sign, then I sign next to my seal. I log the type of notarization, date, the amount collected, names, uh, addresses, uh, phone numbers, email addresses, and any specifics that would help me remember the purpose of the document. And then I ask the, the important question, which is, have you ever had a notarization actually contested in any way? No. And uh, she looked, also looked into becoming a notary for DC, but the guidelines required a lot of extra work and a lot of higher fees. You may wish to research the various state guidelines. So, there are a bunch of different options for how notaries work. But let's talk a little bit about what notaries are there. They're guideposts. Notaries are there to serve as trust anchors for meat space, for reality. Um, they're human certificate authorities. They validate identification documents, record those values into their own register, and then they affix their seal or stamp to the document, register that document, and then furnish the document to the key parties. They provide third-party trust infrastructure for verifying transactions in important situations like large dollar loans, key contracts, other sort of state agreements. Uh, they're important to the trust infrastructure of our legal system, which governs the fairness of business transactions amongst other things. Notaries are important. It's kind of a cool concept, really, when you think about it. So how does that work for software? Like many other meat space concepts and metaphors, notarization is a valid trust infrastructure step to making sure that the software we're using every day is what it purports to be. Tools that operate with trusted relationships. Tools whose security approach is serious, whose privacy implications are considered. Tools like Zoom, for example. <laughs> but really, notarization for software is a layer of interaction and trust. Uh, items are signed in Xcode or with the code sign command line binary. Uh, this signing process preserves the integrity of the code at build time, preventing someone from slipping in malicious code after the signing process. You know, a lot like Zoom did. Uh, once the code is compiled, signed, and archived, the final product can then be submitted to Apple for automated review. All of the signatures are checked. All of the individual inside them individual items inside the product are noted and reviewed, and then a ticket is returned to the developer for attachment to the product. And uh, this example here, which is entirely illegible and entirely useless to you right now, um, will show you multiple things about the piece of software that was submitted. Here, a ticket is actually affixed to, that provides the certification to the user that this product wasn't just code signed with a valid certificate, it has passed an automated review that proves the code itself is built with a hardened runtime with only the entitlements required for the use of the software. Trust matters. As anyone who has ever bought a house will tell you, the process of handling a complicated real estate transaction is painful and involves signing a whole lot of things. Building software is very similar to that. Trust matters. Much as the internet now defaults to transport layer security certificates, macOS requires that. If you want to run software, it needs to be inspected on at least one, if not multiple occasions. And that takes us to an important concept, Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper, as a function of the macOS security environment, was released in macOS 10.15. It was designed, or 10.5, sorry. Um, this is when my eyes are failing me, I've gotten old. Um, it was designed to check out software on first launch, having used file system flags to quarantine items received from potentially untrustworthy sources. And of course, we're all familiar with this dialog box. You might recognize it, or you might not, because you've clicked open so many times without thinking about it that you don't even know what's triggering it anymore. The biggest part of Gatekeeper as a whole is the concept of quarantine. Uh, quarantine as a concept goes back to the Middle Ages when ships arriving in Venice from blacklisted ports would have to wait 40 days in the harbor, long enough for everyone on board who was sick to die and be tossed overboard. And of course that phrase in Italian is quaranta giorni, and so we get quarantine bastardized from that. Quarantines were a way to identify a threat to the healthy populace based on the port of origin and, and the possibility of harm based on communicable and life-threatening diseases, or bad software. Much like the concept of notarization, the concept of quarantine lends itself well to a digital world analog. Files that arrive from methods that support the concept of quarantine are marked with extended attributes. Let's say I've downloaded Atom from the interwebs. 
Before I start the process of opening and installing it, let's take a look at the extended attributes from a command line tool called xattr, um, x-a-t-t-r, uh, which reads the file system's extended attributes concerning a file. There's a couple of metadata items here and a quarantine, a quarantine extended attribute. If we expand the zip file, the quarantine attribute is set on the inside item. And so you can see that in the second command there. So we get a zip file, we take a look at it with xadder, and it shows that, hey, we've got a last used date uh, metadata object, a couple of downloaded date and uh, downloaded item where froms, uh, as well as the quarantine bit itself. Um, all of these slides will be made available after the fact, so you don't need to take pictures of them. Um, here, we're gonna chain a few commands together to actually look at what follows. Um, the first one we've talked about, um, that's xadder again. We're using a couple of flags with xadder here. P makes it print the contents, X makes it print it in hex instead of binary. Um, and we're piping that through xxd, which can, uh, decodes hex to, uh, to a functional value. Uh, and then we're sending that to plutil to read the binary plist out to the terminal itself. Um, this tells us that the file was downloaded on June 18th at 1.15 a.m. GMT, or um, I believe that was like 9.15 p.m. one evening that I was working on this. And it was downloaded as a referral from atom.io to a GitHub file, zip file stored at GitHub. And that's what that array is showing you at the, at the end there. Now let's look at the quarantine object the same way we looked at the previous objects. Again, we're piping it through xadder and uh, xxd to actually take a look at the uh, structure there. And you'll see that we've got a whole line of text right here that looks a lot like this. Let's separate it out to some interesting values here. That's a whole lot of stuff to look at. But what we're seeing is a whole bunch of related information about this download. We get a security score that determines how the operating system handles the file as a whole. And in this case, it's 0083. And that indicates that the file will be scanned before it's opened. We get a timestamp in hex we get the application that downloaded the file and, the, and applied the quarantine information and a UUID that provides a unique stamp to identify just this file. As our score was 0083, which indicates no quarantine check has been performed, that's the high order bit there that says 00, and that the app has not yet been opened, zero, or is the 83 side of that thing, uh, a verification will occur, and by the end of it, it will show you, yes, this check has been performed, and we have moved from 83 to C3, which means this device, I have opened this thing. We have uh, received the dialog up at the top that says, hey, look, I have passed the checks that are required by the operating system, and now this is a functional binary that I can use on a regular basis without recurring uh, re uh, events from the gatekeeper system. So, quarantine. We have done this by downloading a file directly through a web browser. So, go, go, magic remote. There we go. What if I cheat? That's how it's supposed to work in, in Gatekeeper where it all comes together. But what if I cheat, right? What if I didn't want Gatekeeper to interact with the download at all? Enter our friend Curl. I pulled up Terminal, downloaded the Atom package directly from GitHub's releases page, and threw it out to my desktop. And at this point, performed the xadder command again, and said, hey, cool, show me the com.apple.quarantine uh, extended attribute of that file. Well, gosh, no such attribute exists. I have bypassed Gatekeeper by using curl. This isn't ideal, but we'll get to why that's important. Using Gatekeeper's quarantine features is not something that's 100% required by the operating system in Mojave and before. It is required for certain download methods like AirDrop, um, as well as uh, items that will come to you directly from a web browser. So let's synthesize for a minute. All of this into a coherent workflow so that Gatekeeper's roles are fully known. We're going to start this conversation with how this works as a Mac OS 10.14.4 and move forward in time from there because there have been some changes over the last year. I need you to recognize that this next slide is intentionally a giant wall of text. Don't worry, we're not going to linger. If it helps, know that it's there for folks downloading these slides later. So, we have Gatekeeper as of 10.14.4. It operates on downloaded objects with executable code from Safari, Chrome, Mail, or other standard web applications that have opted into the quarantine schema. It operates on items opened in the finder from external volumes, disk images, or airdropped files. Come on, remote, there we go. It conducts an XProtect scan of executable code for malicious actors or other banned malware. 
And then it reviews the signatures of the executable code for chain of trust. Signatures can resolve up to the App Store trust routes or the developer ID trust routes and differentiation in the process exists. Lastly, if all passes, quarantine flags are changed, launch services database is updated, and we're done. But yes, this slide, the goggles, they do nothing. So let's pause here on a blank slide just to reset our sense of the aesthetic. Uh, what if we think about this another way? What if we think about it this way? Gatekeeper's role here is to keep people safe and sound. And so it operates on, on, on these downloaded objects that have opted from methods that are you know, quarantined. And so here we have a Safari download of a disk image um, that has been quarantined. It goes through an inspection process and then a trust execution process and then users opt in and we click the button and everything is fine again. This breaks out into user actions, launch services actions, and then the finality of the launch services database. Um, let's talk about the standard download process. So this user behavior is I have, I have clicked on a download link and a file is arriving. I am opening a file stream to a location on disk. Safari, in this case, will tack a quarantine flag onto that file. It will open, at that point, once it's downloaded, the file will be opened by the users. It's a disk image, so we just mounted the disk image. And then they're going to drag the app from the disk image into the applications folder, and then they're going to open the app, right? So what happens next? Gatekeeper gets involved. It will conduct an XProtect uh, scan of the binary. It will note the quarantine flag and scan for trust as well. Uh, and then it will identify the, sign, the signed app itself and then conduct a dialog. At that point, the dialog will be presented to the user, and so this is the acceptance and launch phase. The quarantine flag will be changed to represent the new score of the item. The quarantine attribute is not removed, it is merely changed, such that the um, launch services database can then be re rebuilt based on the contents of your applications folder, if need be. The application itself is stored as well in that launch services database. And the, finally, the database is updated with a new quarantine score and we can open up the app. So how does this change in 10.14.5? Well, these first few uh, bullet points look very familiar. What about this one? In 10.14.5, it says, I'm going to review the executable code for notarization, compares the local ticket, if it's present, to a downloaded ticket from CloudKit, if the internet is available, and then, essentially execute the file. So if all passes, quarantine flags are changed, the launch services database is updated, and off we go to the races again. So we add another step to our chart. And what it's doing at that point is, when the disk image or the package or the application itself is downloaded to the user's computer, it will have been stapled to it a ticket that says, I am notarized. The contents of that ticket is then checked against CloudKit, where the ticket is stored in its primary state. And then essentially, once that comparison is complete, it says, sweet, you're a notarized application. We shall continue now. And again, this is 1015. All of these steps look very, very familiar. We've, we've talked about each and every one of these last things. Nothing in the initial process in 1015 is different than it was in 1014.5. We add a step at the end. On future launches of those applications, XProtect and malware removal tool checks are run again on future launches. This is not a one-shot deal. This is an every-shot deal. Apple has a very elegant display of this. I have made my own because I was afraid of their lawyers, um, as we all should be. Um, this slide has been sent to me a number of times. I grabbed the screen grab and then last night I was sitting in my hotel room and I was like, I just don't want to take that chance. So there we get a table. In Catalina, this is the behavior structure. This is the Catalina behavior structure here. For GUI apps that are downloaded the way that everything else is and launched directly by the user, they will go through a malicious content scan that ensures that no known malicious content is present in the application. It will go through a signature check that makes sure that this code signing has not been violated. It will go through a notarization check to make sure that this build was notarized by the developer and that that notary ticket has not been revoked. And then on a first launch uh, environment, the user must approve that thing. Uh, command line applications that are not subject to launch services are now also subject to these checks on first use, but only if they are quarantined. Items that are called from the command line only have to survive the malicious content scan. 
They are not checked for signatures. They are not checked for notarization. They are not checked for a first launch prompt. So this diagram is slightly changed in that we, once we got to the point where we were at check mark, we are not at check mark forever. We are at check mark for right now. And so in the future, um, it will then go through that scanning portion again on future launches. I can't tell yet if that's every launch, occasionally, monthly, bi-monthly, bi-weekly. Um, I believe the phrase uh, is file a radar for intended uh, uh, behavior. That is, the, that is the exact Apple verbiage for all of these things. Yesterday, my slides had to change a little bit because we've got to step back for a second. We've got to go back to this slide for a second. Remember if I, uh, how if, if we cheated by using curl to download a file. And when we downloaded a file with curl, we got something that didn't have a quarantine attribute. I was talking with a person over in the uh, WWDC session and I asked the question, how's this work for you know, command line binaries and all these things? And, and we had an extended conversation. He was like, oh yeah, and by the way, you know, files downloaded with curl may also be subject to quarantine in the future. And it was like the record scratch noise went off inside of my head and I sat down and I was like, well crap, what does that mean? What does that even look like? Well, fortunately I had a Catalina machine here. I, yes, I am the idiot presenting on the uh, Catalina machine live. Um, <laughs> But here we are. We do it live, folks. We do it live. Um, the, this is the result of an X adder of a package that I downloaded with curl. com.apple.macl? M-A-C-L? I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking at here. I don't precisely know what this is. I have a couple of good guesses. I've asked some questions. I encourage you all to do your own research and report back. Um, but whatever it is, that attribute is staying. I said, okay, cool, remove, the, uh, remove that, all of the attributes from the uh, package that I put here. And it's like, oh yeah, that's still there. And then I was like, well, pseudo make me a sandwich and uh, re remove it that way. No, that does not work with this particular piece. Um, it, there's a, a, I believe it's been said that this is the mandatory ACL. So that's what apparently MACL stands for. Um, I tried to read it, and um, I was not successful. <laughs> um, it's not for us, as far as I can tell. It appears to be for something in the sandbox.kext file. Um, if you rip grep that particular kext, there are a whole bunch of references inside there to Mackel as a whole, but what that does, ooh, file a radar for desired uh, functionality, I guess is what we're after here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> file your feedback, so let's find out what this does and how this is gonna affect your workflows. Um, but know that if you're curling things down, no longer do you get something that doesn't have any extended attributes. You have an extended attribute. How that affects your workflow is entirely unclear to me. I was able to pipe this package directly to installer and it worked. It actually did the thing that it does, but installer is an Apple signed application. And so it carries extra abilities that perhaps your own internal command line binaries may not have. This may also be part of a new malware detection and prevention scheme. Um, so strongly recommend you talk to your people. This is as of yet undocumented. Um, perhaps you'd like to know more about what Sandbox is doing with this ACL. I would too. Um, so you can see some interesting variables in when you rip grep that kext file. Um, and I strongly recommend that you all go take a look at them because there are things like cumulative count, um, which I'm interpreting as the number of times someone has actually tried to run this file that maybe wasn't supposed to. So good questions. We don't know yet. There's a lot we don't know. Um, the major change to quarantine and gatekeeper uh, in 10.15 is the addition of scans to binaries every time it's launched, not just the first time it is launched. This allows Apple to check for code that has changed outside of the watchful eyes of the quarantine system. And so essentially, it's not a free pass. It used to be a free pass. Once you're on the system, there you can remain. That's not true anymore. So that can be a positive thing. Um, as we all found out unsuspectingly, it turns out all of those of us who are running the Zoom applications, we're running an undocumented web server on an internal local port. Whee! That was fun, right? <laughs> but Apple also demonstrated that they are willing to use their malware removal tool and update their defini definitions and apply the firm and yet loving guidance of the banhammer to people that deserve it. <laughs> 
So, what of the future? What do we do after we've come this far already? So, Apple, of course, does not comment on unannounced products. However, they did say in the session, uh, in macOS security, which is session 701, for those of you scoring at home, that you can always choose to run any software on your system, just not by default. It's a big slide. That, those, the, the, or, I'm sorry. These words were the only words on the screen at the time. That's a fairly bold and broad forward-looking statement that I believe that we can all take with a huge amount of confidence. This was the second part, just not by default. It's also important to recognize that being able to run any software may mean running it by exception, which will require admin rights, a restart, a summoning circle, the waning crescent moon, and the permission of your employer, their lawyers, a young priest, an old priest, and a note from the attendance secretary at your middle school. <laughs> Take that for what it is. At very specifically though, at 11 minutes and 52 seconds into that exact same talk, Apple clearly sets the following expectation. In a future release of macOS, unsigned code will not run by default. That's your ticking clock. You may want to keep the gravy train that you're on right now going. Um, you may have to do more and more and more and more to make it happen without bells, sirens, klaxons, and hall monitors screaming at you. Be aware. Again, that's session 701, required viewing for anyone who is actually using or deploying software in Catalina. It's not a lengthy video. It's incredibly approachable. Everyone should go watch it. There will be a link in the presentation notes to this document, to this session. But Tom, I thought this was about notarization. Okay, understanding notarization means understanding how it's enforced by the system. Gatekeeper enforces the notarization check as part of its operations to prevent quarantine code from leaking before it is checked for integrity and trust on a granular basis. It's the next step down the garden path toward a more secure environment. So what are the tools that we have to think about here? This is a, a fun one. It's the system policy control binary. Um, it's a command line tool for a lot of gatekeeper adjacent technologies. Um, specifically, it's useful determining if an application is notarized. Um, distributing unstable binaries to systems that do not have internet connectivity or that have heavily controlled internet connectivity is an unwise proposition in 10.14.5 and later because they will require user bypass by an admin user on the machine involved, so anything you're distributing into offline networks running 10.14.5 and later will need to be notarized, and the, uh, they'll have to actually have that ticket stapled. Here we see that the application has been accepted by the user for use, as well as passing that notarization check. I, I, I downloaded in, uh, on my work machine here a suspicious package, which is great fun to run through SPCTL. It at least gives us a good laugh. Um, but they notarize their stuff. And so here you can see that it, the uh, uh, prompt has been accepted by the user, and the source is a notarized developer ID uh, environment. So you can use the assess flag for evaluating binaries, and you can use the verbose flag for more detail. The verbose flag is not terribly verbose. There is very, I mean, if you just run SPCTL assess um, path to your package, and everything is hunky-dory, you're just gonna get a flat exit zero. No error, everything was fine. But if you want detail about what's actually been through this system, you're gonna to have to use the verbose, and that is the verbose of output. There are other commands that we're gonna talk about here that are a hell of a lot more verbose, but this is a solid 1.0 check that basically says, I have received something that is actually notarized. We also get um, the reset default for when you mess up. Um, you can reset the SPCTL database, which is actually the launch services database for this kind of stuff. Um, if you have been messing about in SQLite, maybe don't do that, um, but there's a fix for you. And it will actually go back and read the quarantine flags of the applications that you've been already installed in your machine, and essentially it's just gonna check those flags before it actually launches things. And then it's gonna update its database. I also wanna talk a little bit about a stapler here, but we're gonna get to stapler a little bit more later. Um, <laughs> but, Stapler is a new tool that's included in Xcode and the Xcode command line tools. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about its validate command here. 
So XC run stapler is how this operates. Um, and for example, here, we're, we're going to say XC run stapler, and then I'm going to say dash dash staple to apply it to an existing object. If that item has already been notarized, but not stapled, you can staple the ticket yourself. You are not relying necessarily on the developer to do the entire stapling process. You can fix their failure. This is the only thing that you can do to fix their failures, however. So if they're not signing it right, if they're not submitting it to the Apple notary service, those are not things that you can fix. But if they have submitted it to the notary service and then just utterly failed to staple the ticket before they go out the door uh, and deliver it out to you, um, you can do that fix yourself as a Mac admin. We also get the validate flag for checking existing options. So here are uh, two options. Here are two, two separate cases. Up at the top, we have a validate action against a um, version of the monkey tools package um, that the validate action worked, which means that this is not just signed software, it is signed and notarized. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we got to that state in just a minute. The one below it, which is a package of Ignite Connect's uh, kernel extension install package from Oh, right, a week ago. Um, this is 10.14.5 now. We do have to sign kernel extension and assign and notarize kernel extensions. And basically what it says is, hey, by the way, this package does not have a ticket staple to it, period, full stop. So talk to, if you're using Ignite, you might want to throw in a support ticket and say, can you please notarize your download packages? Let's go take a look at the verbose version of, this, of, the exp, uh, of the process for looking at the monkey tool statement. I'm not going to show you everything in the verbose um, interpretation here. I strongly encourage that you take a look at what's stored here in its entirety because it's interesting. I'm just going to show you the top of this command and it's basically like, look, here are all of the properties associated with this package. Um, and you know, here's the type of signature that's in use. Um, it, this package uses a checksum size of 20. You know, it, it's a whole bunch of metadata associated with the package itself and with some of the external details that follow. So it, I strongly recommend that you go take a whip open a terminal. This works on any machine that has Xcode installed in it. You don't need to be running 10.14.4 or 5 or later. You can be running an earlier version of 10.14, I believe. Um, and you can actually take a look at what the actual binaries are doing. So take a look at your stuff. If you have concerns about a package that's maybe internally generated, that's full of signed software, but you're not sure if the developer is notarizing it internally, this is a great way to inspect for that. Again, st uh, Stapler is expecting one of three formats. It is expecting a disk image, it is expecting a zip file, or is it expecting a package file? Those are the three kinds of files that Stapler can talk to. Can't talk to anything else. So look at those things first. I have to go back through the slides, darn it. Come on, there we go. Just a couple more. Sorry, everybody. Didn't plan ahead. So how's this all work exactly? See, you and me have got a cool generator. And this link goes to a song by a great DC band called Bad Moves. Um, go listen, it's an earworm, but we've got all of the tools that, on our Mac to notarize things if we've got a copy of Xcode handy. So the f to get a notarized application from an actual Xcode project file. And um, the one that I'm working with in the example here is the Nomad uh, binary. Um, you need a signed application first. So if you've got an Xcode project already open and you're comfortable with the build process, all you need are a couple of settings changes. You have to enable the hardened runtime and you have to specify a code signing identity. Choose your developer ID application certificate before you prepare your project for distribution. Then once your build is complete, submit it to Apple. You have to archive your build first and then submit it for notarization. Um, you can do this one of two ways. You can do this directly with Xcode or you can rely on the command line tools. It may make sense to use Altool just so that you're familiar with what the command line process for manual review of items, especially as an admin who will want to review software for installation, you will want to be familiar with this process. Step three is a little more simple. It's wait. Binary notarization is not a lengthy process and will take anywhere from five to 30 minutes in my experience thus far. It's a lot closer to five minutes than it has been to 30, at least as of about a week and a half ago. Because um, that was when I was submitting a whole lot of binaries to the system. 
um, getting more failures than I was successes as we worked through some of the processes. And then once you're completed, you need to staple your, your, your ticket to the uh, distribution object of your choice. Um, Apple will store your ticket in a CloudKit object tied to the hash of the object you submitted and to your Apple developer account. Um, it will be retrievable by anyone with the binary object that requested that you requested Apple staple. So that once you have made it available and downloadable, they can check your hash at that point. So long as you have an internet connection, it's not 100% critical that you staple the distributed object because Apple will hash the item that it's trying to examine and say to CloudKit, here's my hash, do you have a ticket on file? And then if it has been, if it has been submitted for notarization and notarization has passed, it will download the ticket and say you're good. However, if you wanna do this offline in any way, shape or form, you have to have the ticket stapled, period, full stop. No ticket? Thrown out of the dirigible by Indiana Jones. <laughs> Staple your ticket. Don't be that person. Do your due diligence to support everyone out there, not just those people with unfiltered, unfiltered uh, unfettered network access. Staple your stuff, okay? That's all I'm asking. So notarization at the command line is a different beast. You need some additional things. The first thing that you need is an application-specific password for your developer Apple ID. If you've never generated one of these, you can go to appleid.apple.com, sign in with your developer ID, and in the security section, you can generate an app-specific password. Call it Xcode notarization, or binary notarization, or just call it Fred. I don't care as long as you know what that application was. And then you're gonna get back a, you know, a, a, a lengthy alphanumeric key. Uh, actually, I think it's just alpha. It's just, uh, it's just A through Z, but there's, you know, so I think it's six blocks of four letters with dashes in between. And then once you have your signed software in a zipped image or package file, um, you'll also need Xcode and the Xcode command line tools. So we're gonna go through an example here, and we're gonna talk about signing and notarizing the monkey tools. Um, who here uses monkey? Who here was aware that it was unsigned software in its entirety? Yeah. So how do we get past this kind of thing? How do we do right by our users and say, we're going to notarize this stuff? Well, you download the source code and you pull open one file. You pull open the monkey slash code slash tools slash make monkey m package dot sh file. And you make one change. It's highlighted there. It's line 424 of the script. And the only thing that you need to add is dash dash options space runtime at the end of that line. Don't get rid of the back or the forward slash that's in there. You need that. It's just showing you the niceties of the of the line there. Um, but to my knowledge, this has not affected the good working order of all of the tools involved. Your mileage may vary. If you break it, you own both parts. Test. Very, very important that you test all of this stuff. And then once you have saved that script in BBEdit, it's super important that you save the script, I found out. If you just you know, make the change and leave the window open and don't hit save, um, it runs it as it was cached on disk and then you feel like a real dumbass. Um, pardon my French. Once that's complete, I'm going to go ahead and run that script and I'm going to specify two actions here. I'm gonna specify an action with a flag that's lowercase s for my installer certificate signing and uppercase s for my application ID sign, uh, signing certificate. Once that's complete, you'll, it'll go through the entire process. You gotta enter your pseudo password for uh, when you're prompted. Um, but once you're complete, you'll be left with a package in the primary directory of the, uh, of the code repository that you downloaded. And it looks like this. It's signed with my developer certificate, which is great. This is uh, a window from Sus Suspicious Package. Is there anybody out who is not using Suspicious Package on the regular? It's free, you get it from mothersruin.com and it's awesome. Um, so this is just a signed package. I have completed the signed build of my process. It's signed with my developer ID, which is identified to Technolutionary LLC. And uh, there's the, all of the information with the package. So let's notarize this guy. So when I started writing this talk, there wasn't a manual entry for AL tool. But about a week ago, Apple released version 4.0 of the AL tool binary with beta three of Catalina. This is now different. So you now get a manual file, which is great. You don't have to rely on your notes to make all of this work. So let's, if you're running beta two, 
you will get AL Tool version 1.1, which has five flags. Validate the app, upload the app, notarize the app, notarization info, and the notarization history for these IDs. These verbs are all pretty straightforward, but we're only gonna talk about version 4.0 today. That adds a couple more. So you'll see here five, and then now we get seven. You can also get a list of applications that have been notarized with that developer ID. Um, and you also get the option to store the password in a keychain item. You could do this before, but it was a giant pain in the behind. Um, you had to make a specially crafted keychain item, you had to do it from the command line, it was this whole big thing, so why not just do it with AL Tool? So here, we're gonna notarize the app. We're going to say run XC run AL Tool, we're gonna run it with the notarize app flag, I'm gonna point it at a file, which is the, at this point the monkey package. I'm going to point it at a primary bundle, I, I have to tell it what the primary bundle ID of the package is, which here is com.googlecode.monkey. And then I'm gonna supply my developer ID and my application specific password. That is not my actual application specific password. It will fail if you try to run it that way. I really hope it will fail if you try to run it that way. <laughs> this is because you can't use two factor authentication in command line tools. So you have to generate the uh, application specific password. As of a recent change, all developer IDs must now have two factor authentication from Apple turned on, on them. Be aware. And so, as a result, eventually you get a request ID that you can review at some, some, some future date. I have recovered this one that basically says, cool, on the 25th of June at 3.40 in the morning uh, GMT, uh, I submitted a uh, re application for notarization. The success of that request was, it was successful in starting the notarization process. I get a log file URL that comes with this that gives me an immense amount of data. It is highly verbose. Um, and if you specify the verbosity flag in uh, AL Tool, you will get so much information. Um, so, so much information. <laughs> Um, and it's also gonna give me a status code about this package, and it will say at this point, this package is approved. I pulled back this request ID after the fact. This is a successful request. So what if I wanna take a look at all of the times I wasn't so fortunate? And I can say, show me the notarization history for this app. Again, requires username and password because it's tied to you. It's only gonna get the one for your developer ID. And so here's an example of the notarization history. You'll see I made four attempts here, one of which was invalid and I can pull the request uh, a UUID out of all of that, and in my case, it says package invalid. In that case, I had submitted the wrong um, uh, bundle ID with the initial package, and so that was why it failed. You can read all of this detail in the log file that is included in recovering that request UUID. So let's look at the notarization in info for that request. And so here I'm gonna make that specification. I'm gonna say all tool, notarization info, one really long UUID string, and then my user and password. And I get this back. Log for, it's a, it's a bunch of JSON objects. Um, there is no reason that you couldn't use this to do something interesting with a Slack bot, for example. Just to say, let me know when this is done. Um, and essentially it's going to say, cool, this is all ready for distribution. There's the file name itself, there was the upload date. Um, and by the way, here's the SHA-256 of the package. And so now when I look at the object itself, after I have notarized the object and stapled the ticket, you will see that this is a notarized binary. And this is complete and it works entirely. We'll zoom in this for a second because it's easier to read that way. Here you can see up at the top that it was signed by a developer ID. It was notarized by Apple. It does require a restart on install and it runs three install scripts. It's a 12 megabyte package for 30.9 megabytes installed on disk. And so there it all is a signed and notarized version of Monkey that works. But what if it's not notarized or stapled, right? That's why we're all here. We all wanna know how this breaks, right? That's the big question. How many people saw this particular dialogue once we got to 10.14.5? It says, hey, a system extension has been blocked. A program tried to load one or more system extensions that are incompatible with this version of macOS. Please contact, I'm gonna shame them, Karyo Technologies for support. This was the Karyo VPN client before they actually got it notarized. I think it is still unnotarized, I am not 100%. So, how do we deal with packages and software, both kernel extensions and applications in their entirety that are either not signed correctly or not notarized at all? Ukulele. No, it's user extend, uh, accepted kernel lo uh, extension loading. Um, we got this um, late in the cycle in 1013. 
Um, who here remembers those particular bad old days? Those were fun, right? Yeah, good times. You might see this particular di a dialogue that basically says, by the way, system software from this developer was blocked from loading. That was a rude awakening. That wasn't very nice. But we got a way around that. We got an MDM profile that we could actually deliver that was user accepted kernel extension loading. And in simple MDM, it looks a lot like this. These are the team identifiers of all of the people whose software we're whitelisting on our own personal machines. You might recognize some of these team identifiers. I don't see them at site anymore. I couldn't tell you for the love of money what the actual um, eight identifiers are that are enclosed here. I'm fairly sure at least one of those is the Cisco client. I'm fairly sure the Karyo VPN client is included in there. There are a whole bunch of uh, software manufacturers that we needed to whitelist because we needed their kernel extensions for some random client here and there. We have diverse client bases um, who are using many different kinds of technology, some of which we like. And that this process was a way for us to say, we're only going to load the kernel extensions that we like. There's also a checkbox up at the top up there that basically says, allow the user to approve kernel extensions that are not specified below, which puts the choice back in admin users machines uh, within, your, within your MDM environment. So here's the good news, and this is good news. Whitelisting a team ID affects the notarization restrictions. So I'm gonna say that again. Whitelisting a team ID of the developer ID that signed the package, again, this only applies to signed software. You can only notarize signed software. If you whitelist their team ID, you have whitelisted the install of their application and the running of their application in the future so that it does not have to repass a notarization check. This is how you get around applications that, that either cannot use the hardened runtime or require additional sets of entitlements that um, then Apple will allow for an app to be considered to be notarized. So, whitelisting, yay. We already have the tools to make this work in our environments. Now, it works now. It doesn't require an update to our MDM, it works now. So there is good news. And remember, anyone can staple as long as the developer has submitted the application for notarization to begin with. If they've submitted the application successfully but failed to staple for whatever reason, you can staple it on their behalf. So troubleshooting all of this. This is one I will let you take a picture of because it's, it asks the question, what does Apple say about troubleshooting notarization? Um, there's a help article within the uh, Apple documentation system about what Apple says about this in the Xcode help documentation. They, the section marked distribute outside the Mac App Store has a lot of details that are useful for this. And it talks a lot about how to troubleshoot the Xcode process in specific. In addition, I'll wait like 20 more seconds for everybody to get that link. This will also be distributed in the show notes after the fact. So if you miss it right now, we'll get back to it. Don't worry. Everybody good? Feeling good? Seeing lots of nods? Lots of phones down? Awesome, sweet. One last one. I got you. There's additional documentation. This is the developer documentation surrounding common notarization issues. And this is where you should spend your time. There are seven common issues that this documentation covers, and you should read the entire article. But they are as follows. And again, I'm just going to take a 30-second pause here. Everybody grab the QR code. I was not ever expecting for QR codes to be useful. Um, I was wrong. It turns out they're actually pretty useful. So strong work, QR code people. I'm sorry I made fun of you for a long time. It was a really long time, until like last week. So there are seven common notarization issues that Apple suggests that you might have. One of them is an invalid code signature. And for that, you actually have to make sure that you are signing your application binary inside out. You can't, sign it, you can't sign it outside in. You have to sign it from the deepest object all the way embedded in the application binary all the way back out because it will do signatures on each of the, the sub-objects in that space. So you have to do this. You can use the code sign by command line binary to verify and validate that you're actually signing this right. Secondly, you have to use a valid certificate. Don't let your developer certificate expire. It's a bad day for everybody. 
So make sure that you're actually using the right certificate to sign it. I know that I accidentally used the install application or the installer uh, certificate once to sign it. For the record, that doesn't work. Um, use the right cert to sign the right thing at the right time. You also have to include a secure timestamp that validates that you are signing it when you, are, when you say you're signing it. And that's a secure process. Um, there's more information about what it takes to generate you know, a secure timestamp in the, in the actual documentation links that I posted prior. You also have to avoid the get task allow option uh, entitlement for building applications. You have to turn this off before you archive. There are other entitlements. You only should be taking the entitlements you absolutely positively need as developers. The principle of least privilege applies to developers too. Don't tell them that. They don't like it. They yell. They throw things. But that is 100% true. Their application should be allowed to do the least possible damage to the environment if it is in some way uh, exploited. And then you also have to use the 10.9 SDK or later to do this. You have to drop the 10.8 builds, people. Please, for the love of God, it's time. You also have to enable the hardened runtime because method swizzling is bad. So essentially, if you're not enabling the hardened runtime, this will not work for you. You cannot notarize your application this way. And, you, and that means people have to actually whitelist your application. That is... That I'm sure that there are developers out there who are currently sharpening their knives to come for me on this one, but this isn't rocket surgery. This is what you have to do. Um, and then lastly but not least, there are stapler problems in iOS, or I'm sorry, in Mac OS 10.13 and prior, um, and you absolutely positively need to be using Xcode 10.2 or later. Um, if you are using earlier versions of stapler, um, you may have unintended results. Um, and the result is it doesn't work. So upgrade, keep the pace, my friends. So that takes us to the summary and we've got plenty of time for questions. I'm marking the time pretty carefully at this point, but we, let's go over what we just talked about. Come on, you can do it remote. I believe in you, there we go. Why does this matter at all? Notarization matters because it gives Apple a, co a copy of all signed binaries. And what they maintain is a torn apart version of all of those binaries. It wants to know what's inside there. What are, fr what are the frameworks internally that it is using? Um, as well as if you're including you know, a third party SDK for something else, and that third party SDK turns out to be substantially malicious, they have a record of everyone who's using it, which is super helpful for them because they can go back to those developers and say, did you know? And there can be mitigation strategies in place at that time. They can also use that to re revoke the notarization ticket of a single build. So it used to be that if you really wanted to lay down the hammer of God, you had to uh, essentially say, okay, that developer ID certificate, yoink. And now everything from that developer and I'm thinking here of a couple of scandals recently that involved um, large social media networks um, where they lost their ability to distribute internal applications entirely because Apple revo revoked their root. Wouldn't it be nice if they, if they didn't have to get rid of the lunch menu, but instead could get rid of the um, quote unquote VPN that was being used to spy on a whole bunch of 13 to 18 year olds and find out what they're doing on the interwebs? Be nice if we could get rid of just that instead of having to bring down the hammer on that. This is a direct result of those kind of things. This is great. Also, as we get to Catalina, XProtect checks on all launches will help stop individual builds as well. So that if there's an individual build that is problematic for any reason, its notarization can then be revoked. And they have a very good idea of what the checksum of that object is and say, I'm sorry, thanks, it's been fun. You don't get to run anymore. You have violated the trust agreement that we've talked about before. So this is like, I have signed a document, but I brought my very well-crafted fake ID. And I, I presented that to the notary. And suddenly the notary realizes, oh crap, that was an expired driver's license. Or that doesn't look right after the fact. This gives you the ability to back out the damage before it's more permanent. So what do you need to notarize something? You need a signed binary with a hardened runtime. You need Xcode installed with the CLI tools. And you need an Apple developer ID with an application-specific password. 
So, who needs to notarize? This is another big part of this conversation. Who needs to notarize stuff? Any software installed via methods covered by Gatekeeper starting in 1014.5 should be notarized. In 1015, it is required. I'm saying you should do it right now. Should have been doing it for 90 days. Should have been doing it since Apple announced this feature last summer. If you're installing kernel extensions, kernel extensions, period, full stop, don't listen to anything else I say after this. They have, to be, they have to be signed and they have to be notarized. And if you're installing kernel extensions, have you asked your software partner if they're building a system extension yet? Uh, as with the arrival of 1015, the, the, the number of things that actually, honest to God, need a kernel extension is substantially lower. If, how many people in here are deploying, shall we say euphemistically, security agents that have kernel extensions? More than half the room. How many of you have already asked your kernel extension provider, your security extension provider, if they're working on a secure, uh, security extension? That should be every hand that went up before. If you are not already talking to people who are providing security extensions to your organization about what they're doing for the future, you need to be. And if they are unwilling to do so, you need to be willing to leave. I'm going to say that again. If, you, if they are not willing to provide you a system extension instead of a kernel extension, you should be willing to walk tomorrow. There's a billion of these guys. Somebody's going to do it. As of 1015, every application and tool invoked by launch services will be, need to be signed and notarized, or it's not going to launch the way that it's not going to launch seamlessly. You may be able to essentially do the right click and open and then hit the open dialog and then perform a blood sacrifice and get to the point where it'll actually launch, but you need to be prepared for that reality in the fact that your users may not be aware and they might ask you the question, well, is this safe? Good. That is the user you reward because they are asking good questions about the security of, their, of, your of your shared environment. And while it may feel like they're asking you a question of, are you doing your job? The answer is, yes, I am. And here is what that actually means. And here's why this particular build is OK, because we've already reached out to the developer and they're fixing it in the next release. Those are the things you need to talk about. Also, in 10.14.5, every app signed by a developer who signed up after the 7th of April this year will also need to notarize their applications that are provided through outside of the App Store. And so if you've got a brand new company, shall we call them Nocturnal Aviation Corporation, we fly by night is their slogan, they're very fancy. Um, but if they're brand new, they have to not just sign their builds, but notarize them as well. That is for any software, whether it is a kernel extension or not. They have to sign them as of 10.14.5, and they have to notarize them as well. How do I notarize these things? You use Xcode directly, and you make sure the hardened runtime is on, and you make sure you're signing it with your developer ID application certificate, not the installer one like I did. Don't be like Donnie Don't. So you can also do it via CLI. You can code sign your build manually directly uh, with your developer certificate and create the installer package that follows that is also signed. And then you can use XC Run Altool Notarize app to submit that to Apple for review, wait for it to actually happen, download the ticket that follows, and staple it to your final application. And then you can, so you, you can staple that and then deliver it. So we have 17 minutes, which is a few more than I was expecting. Apparently, I talk too fast. Um, but that leaves us time for questions. So I have a lovely catch box here. I cannot vouch for the validity of my throwing skills, but I did play a few years of Little League Baseball. So does anybody have questions? It's OK to ask questions. We're all learning this stuff in real time. So questions are welcome. Oh, a little bit off. Up top, there you go. Uh, I have a question about the app specific password. Yes. Uh, is this something we just have to have on a, on a note somewhere that we type in manually or paste in manually to the terminal or can we add it into Xcode? Or so there change? is, um, and let me jump out of the slides here real quick. And we'll go back to all tool and we'll go back and hit play. You see the bottom item that says down there store password and keychain item? Uh, yeah. If you invoke that particular object, you only need to do that thing once. 
and then you just have to specify your user ID and then that you have the, the name of the key that you have stored in the password. I also put my application pass specific password in one password, or if you use LastPass or anything else, um, Thycotic, anything else like that, that's a good thing to store in a um, personal vault, not necessarily the company-wide vault. You don't want Johnny from marketing signing your software, because does anybody trust Johnny from marketing to do anything right? I do not. <laughs> Johnny from marketing, I'm sure, is a wonderful person who loves his children, um, but I'm not gonna trust him with my signing keys. It's just not kosher, so. Question over here. Um, in the section where you talked about um, whitelisting the team ID and yes. some of the effects that that'll have, you made a point to say that works right now. Does that mean that it will not work in 10.15? It will work in 10.15. But the repercussions of that are, hey, you're losing a lot of the protections that you would have from notarization. Like you're yes. saying, not only will it allow the extension, but the entire program and, and essentially any Anything checks. signed with that uh, team ID will now run on the machine without the notarization requirements. I strongly recommend that you be judicious in applying that choice. Internal okay. applications that don't go through the notarization process because they are extremely sensitive and don't belong to anyone but you are certainly a great example of that. Okay. If you have an internal developer certificate that you're building applications with that you know has access to proprietary data, personal data, other things like that, PCI compliance requires that you don't do stuff with that okay. or you don't just give it to anybody, even your trusted software partners. And so essentially at that point, whitelist your own ID, absolutely, 100%, but make darn sure you know who has signed rights inside your organization for software that's conducted that way. And police those rights heavily and, and according to your organization's internal guidelines. Okay. So. Thank you. Up front. Okay. <laughs> Me neither. So. Shoot. Is this? Okay. It is on. So regarding stapling. Yes. It seems to me that there are companies that are forgetting this piece. Yes. And so that implies that it's going to be our job to do that. And more importantly, if that is the implication, what, if any, things have you seen from Apple or anyone that is going to put the onus of that responsibility back on the software developer. Sure, um, and this is the place where you get to do helpful things like vote with your wallet. Um, if you have spent money on software, you have a commercial relationship with the software vendor and you can politely say, hey look, I understand that this is a new thing and I understand that there may be some challenges in your build environment that, don't, that prevent you from signing it natively as part, of my, as part of your process. Either they do all of their builds on an offline network, which means they can't submit it to Apple directly from Xcode, um, but you can also say, hey, look, I really do need you to submit this for notar notarization as part of your build chain and build a structure that will handle that process. But if they're just not stapling the ticket at the end, you can use stapler to validate that and it'll show you there's no ticket attached. You can try a staple of that package. If it works, great, that's what you throw in your software distribution system. And while yes, I would absolutely love it if every developer was good at this and awesome at this and perfect at this, and developers out there who are listening, please do these things. We like you. We like to like you. We don't like to like grumble under our breath and say, darn it, why didn't you do the thing? Because the thing doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, we're talking about, um, it, it most, when I was doing the monkey package, it was under five minutes most of the time. I had one time take 30 minutes. Um, also, for your networks, there's, a, there's another option that's an AL tool that I did not mention prior. You can change how it submits the um, package. You can use WebDAV instead of um, UDP. If your network is blocking UDP transactions on the ports required, you can submit it via DAV, which is an open HTTP transfer. It just takes way longer to do. So those are the kind of things, you, um, right next to you. Many of us work in shops where software is developed primarily for the Windows platform by a vendor, and Mac is kind of an afterthought. You should either make them aware of the fact that you are buying their product as a Mac using organization you expect to be supported like their Windows clients, or you should find a new vendor. What about people who have gotten trapped into multi-year agreements with this vendor with a maintenance agreement? 
Um, might I suggest talking to your in-house counsel about looking at those for outs, especially outs around failing to adhere to good security practices, because this is a good security practice. This essentially says, this is, this is a, a hugely important security practice. And if they are not abiding by the security practice, they're failing you as an organization and you, they might be potentially liable in for- In breach of contract. And they're in breach of contract at that point. Talk to them, beat them up that way. It may not pass muster, but it's gonna make them think long and hard about how much their lawyers are gonna cost versus how much their programming time is gonna cost to fix that. This is not a complicated interaction. If you get a signed build out of them, making them notarize it is not a complex operation. Other questions? Just a reminder, statements aren't questions. So you were saying about five to 30 minutes for the approval? Yes. Um, is it sort of like when you submit an app to like get approved? Yeah. It, it, it gives you feedback as to like, if you get denied the reason why it was denied? Um, yeah, and so let's, let's go back here for a second and I'm gonna jump out of my slide. And we can go back to AL tool again because it's kind of the, the guideline here. Um, when you do the upload app verb and essentially give it a, a file with a uh, bundle identifier and your user and password, it's gonna come back to you with a, a request ID. Um, this also works in Xcode. Xcode, you can, it'll, it'll actually, if you leave Xcode open while it's happening, while you've done your build um, and you've submitted it to Apple, you get a little popover in the upper right-hand corner that says, hey, your build's been approved or your build did not, make, uh, did not succeed in approving. And there is a log file that comes out of this, and you can look at the notarization info, and it will give you the ridiculously long command uh, or uh, URL to go and review the log, and it will tell you exactly what's broken. Um, the seven most common troubleshooting issues, I ran into three of them very quickly because I didn't follow instructions. And so those are fairly debuggable. And again, the Apple guidelines that I included in the, in the talk have a lot of information on troubleshooting those things. And obviously this is a place where developer relations is anxious to, or exceed, at least let's not say anxious, excited to talk to users using their tools because this is exciting. And let's not say anxious, we'll say exciting. Other questions, concerns? Okay. I've got, a couple, I've got two more things that we're gonna talk about just for a hot second. Um, I live in the District of Columbia. Um, I am one of 700,000 residents of the District of Columbia. We do not have statehood in DC. Um, we should, because we have no representation in our master legislature. It's kind of, it's kind of BS. So we've also got a group of uh, Mac admins who meet in the DC area on a regular basis. If you've ever seen the DC license plate, you know that it reads taxation without representation. Um, so we kind of riffed on that a little bit when we created the logo for uh, the uh, DM, Mac DMV group. Um, it's notarization without representation. I have stickers over here. You don't have to believe in DC statehood to take one. Um, if you want to talk about it, I'm happy to go down to Legends and we'll get a beer and talk about it. Um, I would appreciate it if you'd ask your legislature uh, to uh, encourage uh, DC to become a state. Um, it is a fundamental disenfranchisement of 700,000 Americans and that's not okay. So, we'll talk about that for a second. And I'll leave this up on the screen at the end with a QR code that takes you to the blog post, which hopefully should have posted eight minutes ago, um, 13 minutes ago, I changed it to 1140, um, that has all of the slides from today, as well as my notes um, on URLs that were mentioned in the slides, the individual talks that were uh, part of the Apple uh, WWDC stuff, um, and all of that's available here. Um, so strongly recommend you go take a look. This is an evolving topic. We don't know what the final version of this is. Uh, late in the beta cycle in 1013, there were some major changes. I don't expect more changes here in late in the cycle. I think that Apple has listened to the feedback of the community and realized that they need to have some of these restrictions ready early for us to uh, experiment with our workflows. And if you didn't see Robert Hammond's talk earlier today on how you should be testing and experimenting with your workflows, um, I strongly recommend you find it after the fact. Robert is a thoughtful and clever administrator and has a lot of really great opinions on these topics. So strong rec for Robert's talk after the conference when these go live. Um, 
and uh, I think I'm just gonna leave it there. We'll leave the, the, the screen up here um, so you can take pictures and go from there. And other than that, I'll uh, see you at lunch. Um, there are stickers for both the Mac Admins podcast and uh, uh, Mac DMV up at the front, so please feel free to come grab a sticker. Thanks, everybody.